Um, so basically, what I want to talk about here is, I think, an area that's kind of evolving in terms of what we think about. So it's specifically about cancers that are both HER2 positive and ER positive, um, which based on some data that Scott showed you with the differing PAT-CR in these patients, it's kind of bringing into question a lot of what we thought about with regards to these cancers previously. Now, as Christy alluded to earlier, uh, what we've thought about for years is that HER2-positive breast cancers that are also estrogen receptor positive or at least somewhat intrinsically resistant to endocrine therapy. Um, the first kind of thought that this might be the case comes out of the lab, which was back in 1992, when what they found was that if you transfect estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cell lines with HER2, they become completely resistant to tamoxifen. So just that single thing of putting HER2 into these cells rendered them resistant. There were then um, a, a number of retrospe retrospective analysis of trials in the metastatic setting where patients with ER-positive metastatic breast cancer were treated with endocrine therapy. And what they found, and this was proved in a, in a meta-analysis, was that if, you, if the cancers were HER2-positive, the patients did worse the than if they had HER2-negative cancers. And then I think one of the, the most important findings was that if you look at the studies that we did in the first sign setting where you treated patients with an aromatase inhibitor, the median progression-free survival for patients who have ER-positive cancers that also express HER2 was less than six months, which is generally a general definition of endocrine resistance. So this is kind of this data shown here. So this is basically looking at trials in the first-line setting where patients were treated with endocrine therapy uh, alone, in fact, aromatase inhibitor alone. So in the earlier trials where they kind of lumped HER2-positive and HER2-negative together, the progression-free survival, as you can see, was about 9 to 11 months, not really too bad at all. However, more recent trials that have kind of taken into account whether the cancers were HER2-negative or HER2-positive, what you find is that if your cancer is HER2-positive and you just treat with an aromatase inhibitor, the progression-free survival is very short, as you can see shown here, about two or three months. In contrast, if you just focus on the her 2 negative population treated with first-line endocrine therapy, the progression-free survival, as you can see, is in the range of 13 months, so really a, a very marked difference here. So this all kind of suggests to us, well, you know, these cancers are intrinsically resistant to endocrine therapy, and the reason for that, which again, sorry, we're showing the slide again, but <laughs> I think it is my slide, right, Christy? <laughs> So um, actually, it's from Stephen Johnson's review. But just to show you, um, this is kind of what we think happens. So in the absence of HER2, estrogen receptors are a great target. These endocrine therapies all work very well, resulting in this long progression-free survival that I showed you. However, once you start having HER2 present, you get the signaling through the AKT and MAP kinase pathways. And somehow, this ends up changing the milieu of the estrogen receptor, so the endocrine therapy agent, the endocrine the therapeutic agents don't work anymore. And the, that's the reason that Bolero 2 and Tamrad, because you're blocking down here, basically showed this beneficial outcome in combination with, uh, with endocrine therapy. So again, I do agree with Christy, this is very simplistic. We basically know there's a lot more to endocrine resistance to th than this, but the reason it's important, as she alluded to, is because we have agents that block all this pathway, essentially. So why are we talking about this today? Well, we're talking about this today because, as Scott alluded to earlier, a very, um, I think, somewhat unexpected finding in the trials that he showed you where we looked at pre-op HER2-directed therapy uh, for HER2-positive breast cancers was the finding that if you have an estrogen receptor, if, if the cancer also expresses estrogen receptor, the pathologic complete response rate is consistently lower. And I apologize for this slide because it is somewhat busy, but these are the different trials shown down here. And it's just to make the point that if you have an ER positive breast cancer that's also HER2 positive, the PAT CR, as you can see, is lower in every case compared to the ER negative cancers. So why would that be? Because if we really think that HER2 is driving the cancer, the ER shouldn't matter, and we should be seeing equal PCR in both the groups. The other thing that's very important, which again, I think Scott mentioned earlier, is P this, this idea of PCR being prognostic. This again is from the German study that he showed you, and what we know is that if you have a HER2 positive cancer that's estrogen receptor negative, PCR is a very important long-term <coughs> endpoint, as you can see, compared to no PCR. However, if you have ER positive cancer, whether it's HER2 negative or HER2 positive, PCR is no longer a, a prognostic factor, as you can see. So these are ER positive HER2 negative cancers. It doesn't matter whether you have a PAT-CR or not. These are ER positive HER2 positive cancers. You can see that PAT-CR is not important either. 
So this suggests that there's a group of HER2 positive cancers that also express ER, where they are still driven by estrogen receptor, and that's why you see a lower PAT-CR rate, and also PAT-CR is no longer a robust predictive factor. So what other evidence do we have supporting the role of ER in some HER2 positive cancers? If you look at the adjuvant trials, in every one of them, disease-free survival is longer in estrogen receptor positive cancers compared to estrogen receptor negative cancers, at least up to the four or five year mark. And then also, in those trials that looked at using endocr or, so endocrine therapy in ER positive, HER2 positive metastatic breast cancers, the TANDEM trial and the Lapatinib trial, there was a group of patients that actually had prolonged disease control with the endocrine therapy alone, even though you didn't block HER2. So that suggests that in some of these HER2-positive, ER-positive cancers, the estrogen receptor continues to drive the cell, and HER2 is not the driver of these cells. So why is this important? Well, I think it's important because we're, we may be and probably are over-treating a group of ER-positive, a group of patients with ER-positive, HER2-positive breast cancer in the adjuvant, neoadjuvant setting. So there may be some that maybe don't need chemotherapy, for example, because the cancer is still being driven by estrogen receptor, and we know that chemotherapy is not as effective in estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. And then also importantly, and I certainly was uh, somebody that was a proponent of this, uh, the idea of how long you continue endocrine therapy for, we were going to talk about that later on. And my feeling had always been, well, there's no point in giving somebody with an ER positive, HER2 positive breast cancer more than five years of chemo because it's, it's not really doing anything. But I now have to say that I would question that. And I think there may be a subgroup of patients with ER positive, HER2 positive cancers who may indeed suffer late recurrences, similar to what we see with luminal A cancers, and we need to identify who they are. Now, in, as far as the natural history of ER-positive breast cancer, this is from the TEACH study that was looking at the implementation of lapatinib in patients with HER2-positive breast cancer who had not received adjuvant trastuzumab. And the reason I showed you, because this is a nice look at the natural history of HER2-positive cancers based on estrogen receptor. So you can see here clearly, up to four years, there are continued recurrences. Um, and unfortunately, we don't know what's going to happen after four years because, in fact, this trial and the other trials we have, the longest follow-up is five years. But if you look at these curves, the difference between the ER negative and ER positive is greatest over the first uh, two years or so, as you can see shown here. And then you can see this curve kind of just kind of it's not quite as steep as you go further out, whereas this one, there's these continued recurrences, which is much more what we see with ER positive breast cancers. So I would say to you that we really need to follow these patients with longer follow up because I think we are going to see some late recurrences, particularly in the ER positive, HER2 positive group. So with that in mind, is there any way that we can identify patients who perhaps don't need as aggressive treatment if they've got HER2 positive breast cancer? Um, as you may recall, back in the 1990s, there was a paper pub published by the Slayman group that showed that HER2 and estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor inversely correlate. So the higher the HER2 expression, the lower the ER expression. And that basically kind of has stood the test of time, and it's been kind of the thought of, you know, why a lot of HER2 positive cancers are ER negative. However, I think for sure there's the existence of a subset, and they're usually triple positive breast cancers, that are HER2 positive, but actually also have a lot of estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor expression. I don't know if you've seen that in your practice, but I have certainly seen that. So with that in mind, this is a very interesting paper from the group in Pittsburgh where they basically looked at patients in their, uh, in, uh, retrospectively, at patients who had received preoperative transtuzumab-based chemotherapy, and they correlated PAT-CR with the level of expression of estrogen receptor. So you can see here, as we've seen before, if you have a HER2-positive hormone receptor negative breast cancer, the PAT-CR rate is high, 50%. If you have a cancer, however, that is HER2 positive but has a lot of estrogen receptor, I said they're usually progesterone receptor positive as well, look at the PAT-CR rate. It's only about 7% or so. Very similar to what you would see with, with just a standard estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And then the group in the middle here are ones that express HER2 but have lower levels of estrogen receptor, and you can see their PAT-CR rate is somewhere in the middle. So it is possible that by quantifying ER and PR, we may be able to identify these patients that require less aggressive approaches. The other thing that's out there, and this is a very small series, but it still is interesting. This is the 70 gene signature, the MAMA prints that you're familiar with. And this is a paper where they looked at patients with HER2-positive breast cancer, 
And they basically used the 70 gene signature to see if they could identify patients who would have a better outcome. And as I said, all these patients have HER2 positive disease. They actually almost all were estrogen receptor positive as well. And what you see here is that using the 70 gene signature, they were able to pick out a group that had an improved distant disease-free survival and improved breast cancer-specific survival, as you can see shown here. And these are untreated patients. If you look at all the, the, all the patients in this group that were treated or untreated, you see the same data. Again, the 70 gene signature is picking out a group that actually have, as you can see, a better outcome shown here compared to the group that did not. Very small numbers, but again, this is something that I think we practically could use, particularly in HER2-positive, ER-positive breast cancers. So uh, Christy talked about this a little bit before, but there is very clear bi-directional crosstalk between the estrogen receptor and HER2 pathway. We know, and I'll show you this in a second, that if you have signaling through EGFR or HER2, any of that family of receptors, you get down regulation of estrogen receptor. That's been shown. So conversely, inhibition of HER2 with either trastuzumab or lapatinib or any of these agents increases signaling through estrogen receptor. Also, if you look at HER, the HER2 positive models that are resistant to either trastuzumab or lapatinib, in some cases you will find increased signaling through the estrogen receptor. And as we said earlier, there's very clear um, data showing that if you have resistance to endocrine therapy, either acquired or intrinsic, you do tend to have inc uh, increased signaling through the HER2 uh, receptor. So uh, really there's like, a, a, you know, both the pathways are definitely linked. And as you develop resistance to the HER2-directed therapies, ER becomes more active. As you develop resistance to the ER-directed therapies, HER2 becomes more active. So this is just a little schema showing this. Um, these are basically, here's a HER, the HER2 pathway shown here. We know that it feeds through AKT in the, the MAP kinase pathway. And a very important protein called FOXO3A is actually required for estrogen receptor activation and signaling. When HER2 is active and it signals through these pathways, somehow FOXO3A is displaced from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. It's not present to allow activation of the estrogen receptor, and therefore estrogen receptor regulated gene transcription is turned off. Conversely, and more importantly, however, if you inhibit, inhibit HER2, either with trastuzumab or lapatinib, you turn off these phosphorylation cascades. FOXO3A remains in the nucleus. It, uh, it associates with the estrogen receptor, and you end up with estrogen uh, ER-regulated gene transcription. So this is the important thing to focus on here, because if you have a situation where um, you're blocking HER2, right, and you turn off all these pathways, what you could theoretically be doing is actually activating the estrogen receptor pathway, and that can act as a, a resistance mechanism in some cancers. So the clinical relevance of this crosstalk is that if we inhibit HER2 without inhibiting ER in some of these HER2-positive cancers, ER signaling may start acting as an escape mechanism, so it's a resistance mechanism. And I would say to you that this could be contributing to the lower pathologic complete response that was seen in the ER-positive HER2-positive cancers in the preoperative setting. Um, that Scott showed you and that I showed you earlier, and also I think has potential implications in the metastatic setting. So if we just, for every patient with metastatic disease, just block HER2, it's possible that one of the reasons they may perhaps progress is because estrogen receptor now is signaling. Um, so I think that we need to identify these, but there's a subset of ER-positive, HER2-positive breast cancers where ER inhibition is clearly critical. And then lastly, this is very, very interesting. This is a very sm a small series from MD Anderson but what they did was they basically took patients with HER2-positive breast cancer, treated them with trastuzumab-based chemotherapy. They were, the cancers were estrogen receptor negative at the time they started the treatment, but a small number of them reverted to being, or sorry, became ER positive after trastuzumab-based chemotherapy. So in other words, by inhibiting HER2, you're taking this repressive effect off estrogen receptor so that they actually, you actually start activating estrogen receptor later on. So that's something that I think we definitely need to, to, to look into more, but it definitely is very interesting. And how the estrogen receptor would become reactivated by blocking HER2, we really don't know at this time point. Um, just to mention, and so, so I guess what we're kind of saying here is if we could identify the subset of ER-positive, HER2-positive breast cancers that maybe don't need chemotherapy, maybe could get away with endocrine therapy and, and HER2 inhibition, you know, that would be very helpful for, for patients going forward. And there is some preclinical data suggesting that that is a very effective way of treating cancers, 
So this is from the, uh, the Baylor group. Um, what they did here was they took cancers that were both ER positive and HER2 positive in mice, and they treated them either with estrogen deprivation, estrogen deprivation with HER2 inhibition, either with lapatinib or trastuzumab or the combination. And you can see when you block both the, uh, the ER pathway and the HER2 pathway, you get very nice inhibition of tumor growth. When you do a combined blockade of the HER2 pathway with trastuzumab and lapatinib, and also block ER, you can see the cancers really don't grow at all. So Jenny Chang and the Translational Breast Cancer Consortium had looked at this. This is a study that was presented at ASCO about 12 months ago. And what they did was they treated patients with HER2-positive breast cancer preoperatively with trastuzumab and lapatinib, and anybody, any patient who had an ER-positive cancer also got letrozole. And what they found here was, again, the same consistent finding that PAT-CR was lower in the ER-positive versus the ER-negative group, as you can see shown here. But if you combine PAT-CR and near PAT-CR with the feeling that perhaps PAT-CR isn't important in these ER-positive, HER2-positive cancers, you can see there's really no difference between the groups. So by just blocking HER2 and blocking ER, you get this very nice response, as you can see in, in the breast. And again, I would say to you that 12 weeks is just not long enough with endocrine therapy to really see a good response in this setting, I think. And you're going to find data showing that I think if you continue the endocrine therapy for longer in the preoperative setting, you're going to get higher response rates. So I think this is a very important area. So I think what we've known before is there's no question that there are some HER2-positive, ER-positive cancers that are intrinsically resistant to endocrine therapy. But I think based on the data from the preoperative uh, trastuzumab and lapatinib trials, there is a subset of HER2-positive, ER-positive cancers that appear to be driven by estrogen receptor. And I would say to you that we need to identify these cancers. It could be by looking at the level of ER and PR expression, or maybe using molecular profiling like the 70 gene recurrence score. But we need to identify them because they probably will get away with less aggressive treatment. And what I mean by that is maybe you don't need to give them chemotherapy. But also, I think there's probably a group that you really should be blocking the estrogen receptor earlier. And by giving chemo and trastuzumab, you're actually delaying blocking the estrogen receptor. And that could be detrimental in some patients. Um, and then the other thing, as I mentioned, is you know, this thing of being cured at five years from a HER2-positive cancer may well be true, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised if we see some late recurrences in some of these ER-positive, HER2-positive cancers. And um, as I mentioned as well, if, as you develop resistance to HER2-directed agents, uh, ER appears to play a role. Thank you very much. Oh, not that one. Thank you.